Okay. So it seemed to, you know, the old resetting seemed to go ahead and fix it. I'll merge this together and I'll get rid of me saying I'll merge it together. Um, if that helps. Alright. So let's go ahead and keep moving. Alright, so wood foundations. And there's an entire subdivision in Hanover Park, Illinois that I've seen all the houses and wood foundations. And if you, you know, at first I look at this thing and I have to say that, are you nuts? You know, wood rots. Why would you put anything wood across the, uh, or underneath the soil? You know, wood isn't as strong as concrete. Concrete, concrete is the strongest thing in the world. And then I started thinking about the weaknesses of concrete. You know, it, it does crack, it does settle. It's weak when it comes to stuff like that. And if there's a, a crack or an opening, water's still gonna come in and we have to seal it, you know, when that happens, all right? And it's cold. Heat transfers through concrete through conduction relatively quick and easily. Um, so then we, and it's, you can't run conduit through it. You can't run wires and outlets. You can't put insulation in it. So we're bumping those walls on the inside just so we could add, you know, moisture barriers and insulation barriers. There's some issues that come into play there we just don't want to have. Um, so you start thinking about the wood foundations and I'm like, okay, you know, the more I'm thinking about it, there's some pretty good, pretty good, um, benefits from, from these sort of things. So let's look at how we're building it up. So they usually start with a 2 by 12 treated pudding that goes not on the earth, you know, underneath there um, we're going to end up having a pretty thick, I forget the number, but I, I think it's more than 6 mils, but it's a pretty thick moisture barrier that goes underneath this wood and then goes straight up to the side. And that's going to keep all the earth and all the water from getting to uh, the actual wood, because even though it's treated, if it was sitting in water or it would get wet, then it would definitely still rot. So we have to prevent that from happening. Um, but it comes all the way up there and it does get damaged, it does get ripped, maybe somebody put it in wrong, didn't seal seams, there's always a possibility that water can get through. But if water gets through, you're going to know right away. You know, there's not going to be a slow leakage, it's going to come in there and you're going to see water stains on either the insulation, the drywall, or the studs themselves, all right? These are typically built out of two by six walls. Where it comes in there, it might be thicker, but two by six, and remember, double the width of the, the footing where it comes in there. So that's why we have a two by 12, and then we build our two by six wall on top of that. Um, it's all treated lumber underneath there, so it can handle small amounts. That moisture barrier, that comes in there. So that moisture barrier does come all the way up and above the earth. And then this board on top of here is actually considered a sacrificial board. And it will rot. And it will need to be removed and, you know, changed out, I want to say probably every 10 years. Um, it might last longer than that. But it's mostly to be protecting against physical damage from above and to keep water from coming in there. And then we put the siding on top of that. The benefits are, I got a place that I could stuff with insulation. I can make that basement pretty warm where it comes into it. I could run electrical lines, water lines in there. You know, if we're below grade, it's typically gonna be 55 degrees or somewhere in that ballpark, always. You know, as long as we're below the frost line. I don't have to worry about pipes freezing in there. And if something does shift, there should be some movement to allow some settlement that comes into play. And it's wood, so it's easily to, you know, we can get in there and fix something and move it. I actually think it's a pretty good idea. And from what I understand, it is a lot cheaper than pouring concrete into those areas. So, but again, our job is to describe it. It's a wood foundation. Our job is to say, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? and that it's holding the earth back and not letting water come inside. And if that's the case, then, you know, we're just gonna describe and document what we find. And if somebody wants to buy it, that's completely their choice. You know, we shouldn't be just making, um, making opinions or comments saying, oh, it's a wood foundation, so automatically it's bad. 
you know, just we call it out what it is and let people educate them as much as you can and learn as much as you can. But the more I've learned about this, the more I actually like it. You know, and in our society, a little more defense for it, our home buyers, they want to get as big of a house as they, they can nowadays. That's just the, the majority populated belief, I guess. And so the builders, they want to give all this square footage. They want to get the biggest bang for the buck. So without making things dangerous, they're looking for cheaper alternative construction methods so they can give somebody that bigger home that they want and desire. They can make a bigger profit on the houses as well so they can stay in business. And, and it's a win-win-win all the way around. So we do have wood foundations. I do want you to be aware of that, all right? Um, cinder block, concrete masonry units, we kind of use those terms interchangeably, all right? Really, the only difference is the aggregate get, that gets mixed into, um, we'll call it concrete, I guess, for lack of a better term. You know, it, we're, it's just the aggregate that's in there. So if we use cinders, well, then it's a cinder block. If we use concrete, then it's a concrete masonry unit Where when we're building these things. But they're both basically the same thing. They're a figure eight shape uh, that goes, you know, up and down the holes. Anyway, it should be going up and down. And we should be filling those openings or gaps up with concrete to make them solid. I know in above grade it doesn't happen very often, and I don't have any way to check it if it does. Um, we did have CMUs underneath our porch up in the front, and they were not filled with concrete when we did our remodel here. And that was something that we ended up doing. You know, mixing concrete, pour it in there, put our anchor bolts on there, um, and we now basically we made it one solid concrete wall. I would like you to know the term CMU that stands for concrete masonry unit, and then cinder blocks, which were I think it's more of a common. Nobody really puts cinders in the aggregate of the mix anymore to make the CMUs. All right. um, I want you to know something called a bench footing. So I, I know the title up here is basement lowered suspected. But really what I'm hoping you're, you're catching on here is something called a bench footing. So original basement opening was here, but I wanted it deeper, all right? So we dug down and now we made it more usable. Well, although you will see this, people will dig this foundation straight down, you know, and depending on how they hook this together um, and tie it all in there, the biggest fear is for this footing to slide off or be pushed in, and we're actually gonna be creating a kneecap. So to avoid that kneecap, what we do is we dig the earth on an angle like this, and digging it on an angle will prevent this from coming in there. Then we pour more concrete in here, and the main purpose of that concrete is to keep this footing from sliding in. Hopefully we're gonna have a drain tile at this footing level, and because this is lower and the water table is going to work its way down, you know, figure it's just going to slide right underneath here if it gets to that level. We need to be able to capture the lower footing as well and let that water go into any, a sump pit, collect it, and pump it away from the house. This goes around the entire perimeter, and when that happens, it looks like a bench, and that's how it got its name of a bench footing. All right. Um, two different types of... Uh, or two more terms that we're going to be using for foundations. Uh, one is called a raft foundation. And, um, and think of any sort of foundation or hole in the ground as, as kind of a boat. So if we're dealing with um, basements or cross spaces, we're digging out a hole and water is going to want to or go back into that hole. We need to prevent that. So we're, that's where we come in with the raft and stuff. Uh, slab foundations were pretty much pouring straight across on the top. Um, as far as basements or crawl spaces, you know, basements are intended to be for um, walking underneath there. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with the minimum height is six foot eight inches. So as long as we're above that, or you'll find some references to seven feet, seven and a half feet. You know, I personally like things eight or ten feet when they're in there. But, um, you know, 
truthfully, if I could stand up, even if it's not that high and I could walk in there, I'm calling it a basement. If I have to get on my hands and knees or crouch over, I'm going to call it a crawl space. Now, I get it. I could probably stand in some areas that you put Michael Jordan or you know some other extremely tall person in there, and they're not going to be able to walk straight up and down like I can. Or even on the other side, we get somebody who's shorter, and they may be able to walk in areas that I can't walk in. Nonetheless, I don't think it's the end of the world if you call something a basement or a cross base. So getting into the slabs, we do have three different types of slabs that you're supposed to be aware of. I'm going to hit all three of these and then I'll come back to this one. So the first one is a floating slab and then we have a supported slab but this is a two pour slab and then we also have a supported slab but this is a one pour slab. Single pour slabs are called monolithic and we're, when we're in areas where slab construction is popular, this is probably the one that we're going to end up seeing. So let's go to the first slab. Sidewalks, driveways, anything that's floating on the earth, they're usually going to be above the frost line when, when that happens. They're subject to settlement or heaving if water gets underneath it. Um, in buildings, in houses, um, our garage floors are typically going to be floating slabs. So our footings, for, and I'm talking about on attached garages, forgive me, not detached garages. So attached garages, we're going to build our footings going all the way around, and then inside there we're going to put a, a floating slab in there as well. All right. Supported slabs, even though on this one we're showing that it's on top of the foundation, and we do have areas where this is pretty common, actually. Um, I know the Chicago Housing Authority, they build all their construction this way. So on the outside, what we're going to see is a cold joint. So that's going to be the top of the foundation here. And then we'll see the slab poured on top of it. Uh, it's not a defect. It's just it is what it is. The, the problem with that is the area in the middle is still floating. All right, hopefully there's going to be enough stone and, and undisturbed soils, but that's not always the case. All right, because this was dug out, especially in this area here, because they have to make an overdig and it was put back in there, usually you get sediment or sinkholes, for lack of a better word, um, underneath the slabs. And I've literally seen where these slabs have come down and you actually see them start to bend and they drop down and go back up on the other end. It's um, pretty amazing, you know, how much the earth can move. We have a, a few areas in the city of Chicago. Um, it just so happens to be one of the highest, um, most sought after, most expensive areas is Lincoln Park. And this is no way of me trying to diminish the property values there. But there is a lot of settlement issues. But with everything, settlement issues can be fixed. You know, they could do mud jacking. They could do other items to go ahead and solidify the ground or the earth that's underneath those slabs so that they don't settle. All right. Um, single pour or monolithic pours. These are common in detached garages. All right. Um, I visited my son down in Memphis, Tennessee, and down there they really don't have any... Um, basements at all. Everything's built on a slab. I think that's because they have a lot of bedrock that's pretty high and you just can't dig through the bedrock. And, and that's a guess. I'm sure there's some areas that have basements, but most of this new construction I saw down there was a monolithic pour. So here when they run the plumbing and everything else, they have to put all the plumbing, heating ducts, anything that they're going to run underground, they have to get all those items in there first and then they go ahead and pour the slab. Now, this, the, the bottoms of these footings here, the monolithic pour, this does need to be on undisturbed earth, so we can't fill it back in with stones or rock or anything else to raise it up. It needs to be straight clay or whatever the earth is going to be in here. Um, the middle can be filled with stones and rocks, and typically there's going to be steel that's mixed in here so that the concrete stays together. All right. Monolithic pour, uh, very common in detached garages in our area that we're going to end up seeing. 
Uh, basement lowering of the bench footing, we saw that already. All right. A few more words. Bowing, bulging, leaning. Um, you are expected to know these terms. You will be tested on them, and we should really be using them um, properly. All right. So leaning, you know, typically there's not going to be any cracks that are going to be associated with it. You know, these foundation walls should go straight up and down. All right. I know this drawing here, it's showing that there's a crack in there, but typically when something leans, the whole thing is moving as one piece, all right? Bowing, if you see it, that's going to be the horizontal movement. So if something is bowing, it's being pushed inwards or outwards when it comes with it. Bulging is going to think of that kneecap thing again. So bulging is a vertical displacement. So if we get the knee or that's pushing in here with the bulging, that's, uh, that's when we're going to use that term. Cold joints, anytime you have concrete that has cured or dried or become hard, that's known as, and then we pour more concrete on top of that, that's a cold joint. And you'll see definitive lines in there. They're not going to be a crack or anything else. When you start seeing shadows, and the concrete, that's, I don't think they call it a warm joint, but that's where two different pores came in there, but yet the first pore didn't cure yet, all right? Um, but cold joints, one is already cured. So reading cracks is, um, is a big deal here. And I am going to step up just for a second, and then I want to switch cameras here okay and we're gonna zoom in all a heads up my stepdaughter uses this room for teaching as well and um, she likes to decorate my board a little bit more than I do all right so let's talk about reading cracks um, this is probably going to be one of the more important things that our clients are going to be worried about when they end up seeing cracks in their in their basement floors and what's serious and what isn't serious all right now you can always pawn this off on like a structural engineer if you want to, you know, but in all reality, um, a structural engineer is going to be having the same handicap that you're going to have. Uh, the biggest problem with reading cracks or finding out how serious they are is knowing what we know and more importantly, realizing what we don't know. All right. So what, if a house is brand new, and the foundation is like two months old and I'm starting to see some cracks in that foundation that have happened already, I think we could start being a little more nervous about things, all right? But if a house is, let's say, 50 or 70 years old and we see cracks in the foundation and pretty much everyone we're going to run into is going to have that, let's think about what we don't know, all right? Those cracks that happened, they may not have... That entire screen is showing. I'm sorry about that. Perimeter edges are cut off. Okay. Um, let's see if I could zoom out a little bit then. There we go. Hopefully that'll make things a little bit better um, so you can see these things. So getting back to um, reading those concretes. We don't know when that crack happened. If it happened 70 years ago and what we're looking at is as bad as it's gotten and it hasn't moved in you know 50 years, 
that's not a bad crack, all right? But if it happened 70 days ago and things are starting to move, then it could be a serious crack or a, a bad crack at that point in time, all right? Um, we just don't know, all right? So everything is done over time and distance. That's the only way to tell if something truly is serious or not. You know, so if a crack has happened, it doesn't make it a bad crack. If the crack is still moving or the foundation is still moving, we have a serious problem and we need to stop that, all right? So the rules that we come up with and in our company, what we're going to tell people if this is a serious crack or not, um, they're as follows, all right? So one, one quarter inch. So, and really... That's when I get to it, all right? I want those cracks to be less than a quarter of an inch. Once I hit that quarter inch thick mark, then we're gonna consider these serious cracks and we're gonna to recommend to our clients that they get them repaired. Plain and simple, all right? Anything that appeared? Fixed? and came back. Oops, sorry about that. And came back. So this is still moving. So I had a crack, I fixed the crack, or I repaired the crack, but yet it's still settling, so that crack ended up coming back again, all right? It's kind of a big deal. So we want to go ahead and get that one taken care of. Anything that is two directional movement. Anything that's two directional movement, we consider that serious. So if I had a crack, and you know what, I'm gonna put a crack here. So this is typically gonna be a settlement crack is what's going up here. I want you to use your imagination in the corner of this board is a wall coming this way here. Just the fact that the crack is here, I know my foundation is pulled apart. It moved, all right? Now, if that foundation has sliced this way, you know, so it moved up and down this way, or it moved forward and backwards, those are the two directions that I'm talking about. Any crack or anything in the wall where it's moved forward, backwards, up, down, um, those are serious cracks. And they need to be fixed and secured so they don't end up getting worse anymore. Anything where light's coming through it, all right? We'll put that as number four on there. Anything where light is showing through the crack, obviously that's a serious crack. Loose pieces, anything that's coming by are coming opposed. Um, if I see the steel in the rebar, we consider that a serious crack and it needs to be repaired, all right? So our company, we don't recommend structural engineers um, whenever we see these. Now, if somebody wants to disagree with us and they wanna go ahead and get a structural engineer out there and let the structural engineer be responsible for, or or say that it's okay, that's fine too, all right? There's a, a steady phrase that I keep trying to encourage um, all of our inspectors to remember is, when we walk into that house and we start our inspections, and that's not our problem, all right? Somebody else owns that house, I didn't make that crack, that's not my house, I didn't make this situation exist or worse, all I'm there is to view it, all right? and give my opinion about it, plain and simple. However, if I start advising somebody that, hey, this is gonna be okay, there's gonna, you know, you know, you could go ahead and buy the house, now that problem becomes my problem, all right? So, and if something goes bad and it gets worse, then, yeah, somebody's gonna start pointing the fingers at me. And you're always going to be finding somebody that has a different opinion, all right, that's going to exist. Even it might be other home inspectors, it might be um, a structural engineer, and, and it most definitely will be a foundation repair company um, that comes out there. Because even if I see some of these items and I don't think it's a big deal, 
if I have a company out there that wants to sell a two to twenty thousand dollar repair for these cracks in the foundation to give their client peace of mind and they're good at convincing somebody that this is serious and you need to do this and your house is you know and they start using fear tactics or whatever they could talk somebody into believing that these repairs are needed all right so making it clear to our client if you want somebody else's opinion feel free get it now you know but you're paying for my opinion right here and now and i don't want someone else's problems to end up becoming my problem when it comes with it so let's start talking about reading these cracks and trying to identify where the problems are and where they're going to be coming to all right so as i said this wall right here you know i want you to picture this coming out and coming across to it typically whenever we see cracks that are running on an angle like this um that angle is if we follow it so this one's going down and to my left here that's going to point to the last point of support so one of two things is happening here either this whole area is settling or something is lifting up or heaving underneath this point over here all right so if this is a corner i'm typically going to have a sister crack or a partner crack with it and that tells me that corner is probably settling now most settlement occurs from surface drainage all right remember what we were talking about the overdig and the gutters and the downspouts and how far away from the house they discharge um, it also could be sidewalks driveways or even the earth itself sloping towards the house anything where we're directing water to go to that area that water would get to the bottom up here start weakening the earth underneath it and let gravity allow that concrete to settle all right all i'm saying is we should be focusing our attention on that corner to see where that water is affecting this foundation i hope that makes a little bit of sense so we follow the cracks as we go down and think of it as an umbrella everything underneath the umbrella is going to be settling or something is going to be heaving up as well now this quarter inch thing that i got up here um we add up cracks so if i had a crack here and then another one and another one and another one you know and each of these was an eighth of an inch and there's four of them that's a half inch crack all right that means this section down here has moved at least a half of an inch that's significant all right at which time I'm going to recommend that they get a foundation repair company out there now one of the nice things and about getting a foundation repair company out there they're very rarely tell you you don't need it you know they're gonna tell you yeah we should you know put this is and this is what it's gonna cost and this will guarantee that it's not gonna move any longer and that's when they'll start driving piles into the earth and support their foundation from settling again um, structural engineers they're going to be under the same handicap a true structural engineering evaluation means we got to find out if this crack in itself is still moving and they usually put little brackets on there if they're going to do this and it's going to be there for like six months or more and they're going to measure weather rain everything else that comes into that area to see if it's still moving if it's not moving then it's not a problem but in a real estate transaction, we don't have that luxury. It needs to be decided on now. So when we have a few different structural engineers that we call out to these things, they kind of follow the same rules that we do, all right? So I, I, I don't know, for me, it's just, my opinion is, if I know what they're gonna call out as a problem, and, just get, and you wanna have, and you wanna be secure and make sure the problem is fixed, then, get the foundation repair guys out there and have the peace of mind get it done if you want to roll the dice then you as a client you can roll the dice and have it done and you know quite frankly if that's the case then i'm going to refer you to get a structural engineer out here i want that problem if somebody's going to make it their own problem let that guy do it i don't want to take ownership of it and why because i know that there's going to be contractors that exist out there and those contractors are going to 
those contractors are more than happy to sell you the cure for everything and get that fixed. And guess what? You, the biggest phrase that we're going to end up hearing is going to be the um, your home inspector should have told you something. All right. And once that happens again, we're the bad guys and I just don't want to be the bad guy. Sorry, I got a little passionate on that one, so I apologize. Um, common sense stuff when our earth is higher than our foundation or higher than our floor joists, more specifically, then we're going to allow water to get into the wood structure and, and damage that and cause wood rot. We're also going to be allowing for termites or other insects and other stuff that comes in there. Um, these two numbers are need to be memorized, all right? So please... Take the time and write them down. Um, one is for floor joist, all right? And what we're talking about is the minimum bearing. So this floor joist right here, I have to have at least an inch and a half. I don't care if it's concrete, wood, I don't care what's underneath it. I have to have at least a minimum of one and a half inches of this floor joist is supported underneath by stacking lumber on top of the piece that's below it. If this was a beam or a girder, then I need to have at least three inches. All right, so floor joist, an inch and a half, and beams and girders are, are three inches. I do need you to memorize those numbers. CMUs, cinder blocks, I think I may have mentioned of this earlier. See the holes that are going through in this diagram? All right, putting cinder blocks on the sides like that, they have absolutely no structural strength whatsoever, all right? So when we're using this to ventilate for like wood stoves and things like that, that's fine, but not for supporting a house, all right? Those holes have to go up and down. They can't go on the side like this. It looks nice because you got a nice smooth flat surface on there, but that's not how they were designed. That's not how they're supposed to be able to support things, all right? Um, honeycombing, this is, uh, basically it's air trapped when the concrete is being formed. And, um, I don't know, I, I guess in my youth, I watched a few too many cartoons. All right. And I remember like Bugs Bunny and Foghorn Leghorn, you know, they would have something or even Wild E. Coyote when he was chasing after the Roadrunner. They would have an, an item that would be vibrating so much and they would end up holding this thing that was vibrating and then all of a sudden they were vibrating too. And it's like, what the hell are you digressing for? I'm sorry, I'll get back to it. So to stop this from happening um, in concrete, they put these gigantic vibrators. There are rods in there that basically vibrate and shake everything up and they hopefully get all the air that's trapped in there and let that escape and it comes out of there. Um... Well, these screens are, are cut off. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying now. I actually see it on mine. Well, we're going to have to go with these, and then I'll try and figure out why that's happening and work with it later. Um, this I don't know how to fix, but thank you, Mike. And so going back to the honeycombing stuff, we got those big vibrators to get the air out of it. Now, this doesn't really hurt anything structurally. And again, I'm throwing my two cents and my opinion on this thing. But um, once we start seeing the steel, uh, the rebar that's in, mixed in with the concrete, now we're going to expose that to water and allow that to rust. And when it rusts, it expands. And when it expands, it's going to start um, busting up our concrete foundation. So typically, you'll see somebody schmooey over uh, a parge coat or put more mortar or something on top of that just to make it smooth and but all in all for the most part small areas I really don't care about and I don't think it's that big of a deal all right so our supports as I said on the bottom of the support it's supposed to be the the key way that's going to keep it from kicking in and then we have anchor bolts on the top and the floor dro floor joists that are going to keep the tops from going in there as well so we need to support them both at the top and the bottom when it comes to it.
And obviously if we don't, things start leaning. If it gets too far and we have more earth pushing on it, we're gonna end up with more problems that come in there, all right? Now there's other options. Keyway isn't the only way. Um, I've seen where people put uh, steel rebar up in here too. Um, but it, after the house is built, there's no way we're gonna tell what's there. We're just gonna look and see if something's given away. So if it looks like the bottom is being pushed in or the top is being pushed in, those are the things we're gonna wanna photograph and document, all right? Horizontal cracks are pretty serious. You know, if you start thinking about the, the horizontal cracking on it, when you get that knee buckling, and I don't know if any this has ever happened to you or not, but sometimes you get where somebody um, gave you the old kick behind your kneecap, and then the weight of the body is pushing down on that as well. So we have the weight of the house pushing on the foundation with a horizontal crack. That gets pretty serious, you know. So as far as we're concerned, they shouldn't be ignored. Now, that doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Everything can be fixed and repaired, all right? Um, yeah, it's, it just doesn't need to be ignored is what we're going at. So different things that give us that horizontal movement, that horizontal pressure, um, tree branches, I've seen that where that's happened. Um, a good rule of thumb is thinking that whatever the, the leaves, you know, it's called the drip line as far out as they go, however thick the roots are, I'm sorry, however thick the tree branches are going over a house, you should be picturing that the roots are just as thick and just as strong. Wherever those branches, how far out they go, those roots are trying to get there as well because that's how the water is going to be dropping down to the ground and those roots need to get to that area in order to capture the water and bring it back into the tree. All right. So big trees, big roof lines that are going up over houses, there's a good chance that there's good, good tree roots coming either under our foundation or going into the foundation as well. All right, so one of the easy solutions, we encourage people not to let the trees grow over the house. Trim them back and, and keep them smaller so they're not getting in there. Not to mention the damage and stuff that they do to, um, due to the roofing materials when they rub on them as well. So that's another issue. Um, heavy vehicles or heavy weighted equipment, you know, as they're shown in this diagram, vertical weight comes down, pushes the earth into the foundation. That's another thing that could cause some movement. Even when the backfill comes in there, if it's shocked and too hard where it goes in there, then that's also something else that can create issues and problems with stuff, all right? So again, it's not necessarily the end of the world when you're getting this happening to you. Um, and it can be fixed, and we'll talk about some of those solutions in a little bit. Um, this is another one that's actually pretty common. Um, I know there's a lot of areas in our south suburbs and where they use um, cinder blocks or CMUs for construction, and typically around a foot below grade level, you know, or less, we're gonna get water that gets in between the blocks in here or into the concrete, whatever, on a horizontal crack, but yet we're not below the frost line. So that water gets in there and it freezes. And when water freezes and turns to ice, it expands, it, it's solid now. And it literally heaved that section, all right? That phrase is called ad freezing or ad heaving. Anytime we're taking, you know, heaving is moving the whole thing. Ad heaving is moving just part of it, all right? So if we get water coming in there, you'll see a horizontal crack that is present, but there's no bulging with the walls whatsoever, all right? So as we go back to these other pictures, we can see there's bulging that's associated with that horizontal cracking. Even though this picture is kind of showing the same, typically there isn't, all right? This doesn't panic me as much, but I still think it's a good idea to make sure we put something in there, get the water drained and drained away from the house so we don't take the chances of that happening. Um, I don't think I've ever run into um, a foundation being too thin. I honestly don't measure anything. I really don't know how you would be able to get to a spot to measure it in the first place, unless it's a, a cross space opening or you know something like that. But um, 
you know, it exists, I guess, and that's why we're going to chat on it right away. So now we got a horizontal crack, and there's two different ways that we could fix or keep this crack. The goal is not to bring the foundation back to normal, but what they're trying to do is stop the foundation from getting worse, all right? So if there's a, in this situation, this is called a buttress, all right? So on the left side of the picture, you can see we poured a new footing underneath here. And that footing is supporting this concrete wall that's 90 degrees perpendicular to the actual foundation wall. The top of it, right above the red dot there, we ended up putting uh, lumber, whether it's two by fours or whatever. The whole idea of that is to keep the top from being pushed in. So we tie this into the floor on the bottom and fill it in so we keep the bottom from being pushed in. We fill it all with steel because we need to have the tension strength that's going on there and then we put poured concrete to fill that line. So how do we tell if this is working? I shouldn't have any sort of gaps here or here. Um, and also we should want to know who did this. You know, This is one of the things where I encourage people, or I'm talking about my clients, we need to go into journalist mode here. And that's the who, what, why, where, when, and how. All right, who did the repair? When was the repair done? Why was the repair done? Were any additional repairs done? Did this fix the problem? Is there any sort of warranties that are associated with it? You know, again, let's not take somebody else's problem and make it our problem, all right? We identify the issue, we let our clients know what it is, and then there's more homework that needs to be done. Uh, it's not our job to be responsible for these. If it does happen, you may see multiple buttresses that come in here. And again, each one is designed to keep the kneecap from pushing in, all right? Another one is a pilaster or pilaster. However you pronounce it, I'm fine with it. Here they're shown with bricks or cinder blocks. Um, sometimes they'll use I-beams when they put it in here. Again, the main thing is to keep the kneecap from coming in. Again, we're gonna support the bottom from kicking in and we're gonna support the top from moving. Not always is this gap in here filled in. All right, now if this is solid and the the damage and it's not bent, it's not curved, you know, even if this area is touching and the other areas are not, then we're gonna say that it's probably doing what it's supposed to be doing. And it's holding that kneecap back again, all right? Um, however, if it is damaged or cracked, then it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And again, get your clients in the journalist mode, all right? Same thing here, they've done I-beams, and I see this a lot. I got a feeling because it's the easiest method to put in there, so they're gonna concrete the I-beam down low, get it up nice and tight, secure it to the flooring up above, and again, I don't, you know, unless you could see that it's bending or giving way, I don't know any other way to tell if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, all right? Um, something else that's not in here is, I, you know, where they'll drill through the concrete and they'll go to undisturbed earth, so maybe 10 feet away, and they'll dig a trench out there and they'll put two plates on each side with a steel rod and they'll tie those together. That's a pretty common repair as well. And you're gonna see plates on the inside of those, all right? All of these are supposed to be done with professionals, you know, and all of them should have some sort of a warranty or guarantee that's associated with them. But again, you know, those are the companies that made the profit off of the repair. Those are the companies that made the repair and designed the repair and should be responsible for the repair. So that's part of that journalist stuff. Let's get them involved in it and let them be there. This is one of the methods that I don't like when I see it. And I start getting nervous when I see these super thick um, window wells or you know, if there's a big cavity above the wall on the finished ones where the insulation is, and, and now I got like a foot and a half, two feet up on there where my walls start and this thing ends, and you can't see this. If somebody puts a, another wall up there and then all of a sudden we have drywall and finishes on there, we don't know what's going on back there, all right? Now this is designed to take the weight off if the floor joists run perpendicular to it, so it's removing the body from the top of the kneecap. 
but it's also designed to keep the kneecap, you know, from coming in there as well. And again, use your disclaimers, you know, I'm sorry that I'm harping on it, but just don't let other people's problem become your problem, all right? So different types of movements, whether it's in the middle, whether it's up high, whether it's down low, whatever the case is, our foundation is supposed to be straight up and down. We did say that there is an acceptable lean that is one third of the width. So typically on an eight inch foundation, if I round up to nine, one third of that means from the top to the bottom, I could go over one third of the width of what it is, so three inches would be the maximum lean or just under three inches, all right? Um, on the outside, I like to see that foundation, plain and simple. If the earth is higher than the foundation and we don't have that clearance, um, you know, I'm calling out wood rot, termites. Just everything is about uh, designing to pre prepare my clients for potential issues. And then I'm going to be aggressive on the inside and we're going to look for them. Um, but nonetheless, we don't want to ignore it. Uh, typically, it's going to be 8 inches for wood frame structures above grade. And then concrete or brick, it's going to be 6 inches. But if it's a true brick home, it's going to go all the way down. or It's going to be difficult to tell exactly if I'm above the floor joist or not above the floor joist. So that's what they're trying to show here. Use other clues. Even though we're, we're showing more of a concrete with a wood frame structure on top of it, I think a better foundation to use in this drawing would be an actual brick foundation where we're three widths for the foundation and two widths, so it's this true brick structure above grade. We need to figure out if our grade is below or above the floor joists in there. So looking for water spigots, looking and seeing how they go outside from the inside, dryer vents if they're in the basement, Electrical feeds, if they come out that way, and wires coming out of it. If those areas are below uh, the earth and it's coming out of the earth, then there's a good chance that our, our uh, earth is above where our floor joists are as well. Don't be afraid to look at the window wells. You know, obviously, if the earth is higher than our floor joists or our window wells are higher than our floor joists, that's also saying the same thing. All right. So now we have that horizontal crack. And this is kind of with the drawing that I put up on the board earlier. So I got an angular crack that comes in here. We follow this one down into the right and it goes to the last point of support. That means everything underneath of it is settling. All right. So we're saying that this section is settling. Now this drawing I firmly disagree with. I think mud jacking is probably the worst way you can go ahead and repair a foundation with a basement. And, and try and make it. Now, if this was a slab, that's a whole nother story, all right? Slabs are great. Conc sidewalks, uh, driveways, monolithic pours for houses and detached garages. This would be a great solution, all right? But if I have a basement and a strip footing or a spread footing going around, it's just, we don't know where that slurry is going to go. And we don't know what it's going to fill up or pull anything up there. So it's really just not a good idea. All right. This one is a helical anchor. Now, most of the repairs in our area are going to be from the inside and not from the outside. And if you think about it, you know, you need to get to under the footing to make this happen. So you can either dig down eight feet and get to the footing then and get underneath the footing to put your bracket on there and then attach your your pile or your helical anchor into the earth to go ahead and start raising this back up but the inside of that house was already dug out all right because we have a basement in there so now all we have to do is bust open that flooring on there and go down about a foot or so and we have plenty of room to work in a nice controlled environment. So most of the repairs that we're going to see are going to be done from the inside, unlike what this illustration shows being from the outside. So a helical anchor is a screw, basically. And, you know, same thing with screws. Sometimes we're going to screw that into a piece of wood where there's so much friction, I can't turn it anymore. All right, so I'm done. And that's basically what's going to happen here. This thing's going to keep spinning into the earth until I get enough um, friction on this thing and then they're going to be able to jack that building back up or at least support it so that it's not going to want to go back down again 
So helical anchors are more of a screw type mechanism as opposed to a pile, um, which is forced down usually with hydraulic pressure that's, that's going to end up being happening. So again, the drawing shows it from the outside. Typically, it's going to be done from the inside. With these, it's even less damage. They only have to make a, a small opening, just enough to get the bracket bolted onto it. And they do that for each foundation. Typically, you're going to see them, well, I would say, every somewhere between 5 and 10 feet. So, you know, more towards the 5-foot mark. And they're going to, and you'll see those brackets will stick up once they pour that concrete. So you're going to see where it was. Or maybe you'll see the rod sticking up there as well. And they'll put the bracket on there, attach it to the machines, and usually if they have to do a whole wall, they'll have all of them going down at the same time so that hydraulic pressure will all be tied together. And the weakest one will move first, and then when that starts getting pressure, and then the other one. And this way they get everything working at the same way so they can lift the house up equally and evenly and they're not making things any worse. And again, their goal is not to bring the foundation back to where it was. They would love to do it, all right, but they never make that promise uh, to make that happen. The big audacious goal here is to keep it from moving further. So they drive those piles until they get enough pressure to where they do get a counter force coming and the walls are moving back up. Then they stop, all right. They don't want to take a chance of doing any sort of damage in there, all right. I've seen, I've seen repairs. Um, you know, I, I went out to I like the Lake Geneva, Illinois area quite a bit, and because it's right on the Mississippi River and they got a lot of sloped areas there and and some big drops with retaining walls and stuff, they get a lot of earth movement out there as well. And usually you'll end up seeing stars on the back with rods that are going through the building and they're kind of holding everything together, figuring. If this thing's got to go down, it's got to lean to go down. So if I keep the walls tied together, then that's going to work as well. So sometimes you'll see rods going through it. And, and typically on the outside, you'll see a star or some sort of a plate or, you know, that comes in there. And that's just to keep the walls from going outwards. All right. And, and usually you're going to find those on, like I said, the areas where you get those steep slopes that go down there. Because the earth is moving and it's starting to take part of the house with it. All right. A um, few other rules, and again, I'm not going to call these things out if they don't exist. Now, the lady that drew these illustrations with us, um, she drew them, you know, based on what I told her. You know, it looks like they're talking about the footings on here. We're not. We're talking about the tops of the foundation walls. The footings should be straight across. Those should go underneath uh, the frost line as deep as we're going to go on to this stuff. So if this is a walkout basement, maybe that we're looking at, that footing is actually going to go all the way straight across and we'll have a foundation here. What we are talking about is when we start building on top of, on to our wall on top of it, we're going to be putting downward pressure on these things. So we don't want to have narrow pieces with big drop offs on there. So at a minimum, we should be two feet um, on a horizontal run. At a maximum, when we have the step downs, it should be no more than two feet. All right, but really, we're we're trying to figure out if I'm if I'm steeper this way, I have an easier effect to shear that off. But if I'm this way, it's it's much harder to create that shear on that triangle. Um, to get it to step off. So I would like you to remember the two foot number. Um, when we're dealing with settling and movement, um, usually we're going to have uh, constant movement or we're going to, or, or everything's moving at the same time, or we're going to have differential movement, which means part of the structure is moving and part of it isn't. So it depends on how you look at this rotational settlement crack. You can see the original house hasn't moved at all. And then the addition off on the left hand side, that entire addition has moved or pulled away. And that's why we're seeing the crack here. So you could count on this section still remaining one piece. All right. And then that's not differential settlement. But if you count this as one big structure, 
this one's moving and this one isn't, now it is deferential structure. Whenever we see the cracks in the building itself, this is definitely differential structure. So like this area here is holding up, where this area underneath here is settling, all right? So again, we follow our crack down to the last point of support, go to the right side of the door. We're either heaving up here or this part is settling. And because gravity is pretty damn strong, I think it's pretty safe to say we're probably settling, all right? Same thing here. My crack goes down. Here's my sister crack on the other one. Our best bet would be look for this post to settle. So this whole thing is dropping, plain and simple. All right, when everything moves together, all right, that's called heaving, and it moves the whole object. Whenever it moves in the middle, and so part of the underside stays in one place, that's called add heaving or add freezing. And these are just the different things that causes buildings to go upwards. Heaving is up, settlement is down. Same thing if we're dealing with piers. So we dug those out and we pour concrete in there. If the whole thing is moving, then it's add heaving. I'm sorry, if the whole thing is moving, it's heaving. If the only part of it is moving, then it's add heaving, all right? And then if the, again, the whole thing is moving, it's heaving, all right? Um, this I've only seen one time. So we hit a beam pocket and it just so happened to see a steel beam too. And then the earth or whatever was pushing that wall inwards. And I think it was next to a parking lot. This was a commercial building. And so the whole foundation just started pushing in and that beam is now sticking out of there. All right. You, as much as that beam was doing and then whatever gap was there originally, that's how much that foundation has moved. Far more than one third of whatever its width was, and you know, we considered it serious, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. You know, I just said my opinion, they asked for it. I told them, yes, I think this is serious. You need to get a foundation repair company out here. If you're looking to say that this is okay, it won't be me. You know, if you want to get a structural engineer, go ahead. You know, that would be your cheapest way, but I, you know, that would be their choice, all right? I, I can't do it, I'm not gonna own this, or it's not gonna be based on my words saying that it's okay. We may mention about ex, um, excessive brick overhang, and again, we wanna remember that one third of its width is acceptable, and um, anything more than that is past our tipping point with the dominoes. Um, this drawing here, this uh, talks about cracks in foundation. Now, this particular crack that I'm looking at, I'm gonna photograph it. It's going in my report, all right? And I'm going to take ownership of this one as it exists here today and say this is really no big deal. You're gonna find this is a window down on the bottom here and you can't really tell because it's so small in this drawing. And then this is above grade and you know, obviously we can see our floor joists and everything running up there. You're gonna find that these 90 degree corner spots around windows and doors, you're gonna see a lot of cracks that start right in that area. The bottom line is when concrete dries, or the proper term is cures, it shrinks, it gets smaller. So what's happening is concrete is shrinking and going up this way and it's shrinking and going this way and that 90 degree corner right here, that's my weak point. And when that happens, you're gonna get a separation crack right in here. Now there's no water stains in there, you know, and most cracks, that's my biggest concern is water seepage coming into the house. And that would probably be everybody's biggest complaint that they would get on this. But that would be my number one concern is um, the cracking and the water seepage coming in there. I would not recommend this be repaired. I would not recommend that you know you do any injected epoxy, you do nothing with it whatsoever. However, things may change and I will prep my client for that. If we do start seeing water seepage or it gets wider or it changes, then you know action might need to be taken. So it can definitely be a problem down the road, all right? Here we have another small crack, less than a quarter of an inch, but you can see the different water stains, more so on the bottom those stains are and then less and less as we go up. But you can see how dark and intense everything is on the bottom. This one I'm gonna prep my client. Water did come in there. I consider this an active water leak. 
and I'm going to tell my client that they should get injected epoxy. It's not bigger than they, or not a quarter inch or bigger. It's not two directional movement. It hasn't been repaired yet, so we don't know if it's coming back on the crack. So it doesn't fall into the other list of items that we had up in there. So I don't think it's a structural concern, but I definitely would stop the water seepage from coming in. Um, typical water seepage repairs is what we refer to as injected epoxy. And the first thing they're going to do is take these little funnels or cups in here and tubes, and they're going to schmooey the epoxy. And, and let me take that back. Beforehand, they may even gouge out that crack and make it wider so that it's easier for the epoxy to get through the crack and get to the outside. After they do that, they're going to put these little cups on here and schmooey the the epoxy over the top of that and they'll do each one of these things roughly every six nine twelve inches apart and work their way up the crack they'll let that cure let that harden and then they're going to schmooey over the top of the crack and in between here another coat of this so they're going to seal the top of uh, or the inside of the injected epoxy all right now that may be enough and that may work all right but truthfully, the best repair you can do is try and get that epoxy through and through the concrete and have it come out the other side. So we're filling in all these gaps and openings and winding it up on the other side. And then we're kind of gluing this concrete together. Not kind of, we are gluing or epoxying this concrete back together again. So what you do there, and after, after all this is dried, you start at this bottom one and they're going to get a pump that's going to put that epoxy mix in there and they're going to place it under pressure and they're going to force it into that crack and they're going to keep pumping it in and pumping it in and pumping it in until sorry I dropped my stuff they're going to keep pumping that in there until all of a sudden all of a sudden it starts coming out of the hole above it all right so once it starts coming out of this hole here, then we're going to put a cap on this bottom one so it doesn't leak out anymore. And then we're going to put our pump onto this one. And again, pump that in there and keep pumping it until it comes out of this one. And so forth and do the same process until it comes all the way up. Now the caps are only put on there when the slurry is wet so it doesn't leak back out. Once all this stuff dries, then those caps can be removed. There's no reason to keep them on there anymore, but that usually takes a day or three, or maybe longer, I really don't know, nor do I care, um, to dry and, and be solidified, all right? So if somebody wants to finish this basement, they can just cut those off and if it gets in the way. They can leave them alone too, it just doesn't matter, all right? So inside fire damage rods, cable steel, um, this no foundation one is something that happens quite a bit. You know, somebody has a patio or a slab, a floating slab outside, no foundation, no footing, not even a monolithic board. And then they want to put some sort of shade cover over the top. So they put a couple posts on the sides and they, you know, put up a lightweight roof up there. And they're like, okay, this is enjoyable, but now the bugs are bothering me. So then they start putting some walls in there with screens. You know, this is great, but now I want to use this in the wintertime. So they put more walls up and... Next thing we know, we just built a room on top of a patio slab. So keep your eyes open for that. Don't be fooled if that's the case. And if you don't know if it is or isn't, and one of the best things that I like to tell people is I don't know. You know, I don't know what kind of footing that I have underneath here. I don't know if this is acceptable or not. I don't know if somebody got permits and they put the, you know, and they had it inspected during here. You know, all I know is I have a slab of concrete and they may have built on here and then I'm going to look for signs of movement along the roof line as well. All right. So let's move on to the floor joist. Um, type, material, condition, safety concerns. You're going to see that's kind of relative that comes in there. So even though we have termites in our part of the country, they're not really all that big of a deal, I guess, when it comes in here. They're not as as prominent as I would say like Louisiana um, and the southeastern states where it's very moist in the earth and and they're close to closer to sea level there but we do have them here so and it's not a common practice that we end up putting termite shields 
on there. Now a termite shield would actually be a piece of metal that would go, I believe it goes underneath the sill seal, all right? So this is the inside of the house, this is the outside of the house. That piece of metal would go underneath here, underneath the sill seal, and you would actually see a piece of steel that um, exists. What about multiple small cracks and multiple walls? Um, again, as I kind of mentioned earlier when I was drawing on the picture, if it went up there, we add all those cracks together. That's our company's policy, all right? So if I have a bunch of cracks that are going in the same direction, and they're all, let's say there's five of them, and they're all about an eighth of an inch thick, that means that crack totally, or that foundation has moved five eighths of an inch. Five eighths of an inch is over our quarter inch mark. We consider it serious, and we would refer that to a foundation repair specialist. And it's okay if people disagree with me, all right? Um, those, we set up policies, and those are our rules, and that's what we're going to be calling out. Um, the company is ultimately responsible for the words of the inspector, and we, it's my goal now that we have other people working under this name, and of course I want the agreement of all my inspectors, but it's our goal to be consistent, all right? I don't want one person being lighter than a, on something than another. So going in there and saying the same thing is, is kind of important to us. So going back to the termite seal, and thank you, Mike, for that question. Piece of metal underneath the seal seal and it sticks out. If, and as long as we can see that and the concrete is visible and it's not buried, termites have to come up the, come up the concrete, build a tube because they need to stay in wet area to get around the steel in order to get back up into the house again. At least it makes it noticeable where we're going to be able to see it or the homeowner is going to be able to see it and they could take action and get an exterminator out there. But because termites aren't as dangerous of an issue here um, in the Chicagoland area, it, it's not a common building practice, all right? But they are here, all right? I, you will run into homes with termite damage um, and that termite damage can be severe and you know, and so putting termite shields on here is a cheap piece of metal that you would put underneath the sill seal. I really think it's a good idea, but it's not a common practice that we have. Because the top of the concrete is not going to be even, we're going to put some sort of styrofoam sill seal underneath here, and that's to pick up those minor imperfections and give me a more of an airtight barrier there to keep drafts from coming through there. Then we're going to, if we're on top of concrete, we're going to use treated lumber and we're going to bolt that treated lumber into the concrete itself. So as the concrete's poured before it's dried, they're going to put these J bolts in here. We want to make sure they stick up high enough to be able to put that um, sill plate on there as well. You'll find that the sill plates going over steel, they don't, they're not typically treated lumber. Um, they're not required to be, so the only time they're treated lumber is to when they're over the concrete. Uh, the numbers that are written up on the screen are going to be testable numbers. You should have those memorized. Um, anytime we start and stop one of these sill boards or sill plates going down, um, we need to have an anchor bolt within 12 inches there. Now, when they're putting the anchor bolts in there, they don't always know when, um, how long of boards they're going to be putting up there. So they may not be accurate. So typically it's going to be 12 inches from the corner, anywhere in that ballpark, and every six feet gapped after that. So 12 inches from the corner and every six feet from then on. Um, you know, you're going to find sometimes these are too short and there's no way to get a nut or a bolt on there. I've seen where people break them off and they fake them and put it on there. I actually found twice where I reached up there and, and grabbed it just because I heard somebody else tell me this story, you know, and I pulled it off in my hand and it wasn't bolted in there. So, um, yeah, having it, you know, checking it isn't a bad thing and it's not a bad story to share with somebody what you're doing anyway. Um, it might even give your client a little bit of warm fuzzy because nobody else would ever think to go ahead and check and make sure those things are, are secured, especially when it's easy, like in a garage or you know, something like that where you can actually get a good clear view of everything and make sure it's simple to see. 
Just give them a little movement, see if they're tight or not, all right? Um, we talked about the treated lumber already. And again, look for wood rot, look for termite damage. Don't be afraid to get an awl or a long screwdriver. Do some sort of probing. This is a little bit repetitive on here, but we're gonna look for any sort of damage at all to the floor joist or to the sill plate itself. I also wanna reiterate one and a half inches to support a floor joist, three inches to support a beam or a girder, all right? Underneath the floor joist, and this particular drawing is really showing more of a balloon frame construction as opposed to our standard platform uh, construction, so we're not stacking our lumber on this one. And sometimes we're going to get a foundation that is just really wackadoodle, all right? Um, we shouldn't have any gaps. They should be filled in there. It should be straight, level, nothing going up and down. I am allowed to shim floor joist, all right? I would like you to know it's one shim, one shim only, and that shim has to be uh, a material that's naturally resistant to rot or plastic or steel, all right? If I go multiple shims because I need something more, then those have to be high density plastic or, or steel that needs to go in there. So if I put a shim in here to get this back up and level, if I can get by, and when I'm talking about shim, I'm talking about those cedar one quarter inch to zeros, all right? So if I need more than that quarter inch, I don't make two inch blocks of cedar wood and stick that in there. That's not what happens. That could be stacked with steel or plastic, that's fine, but not with the wood. So if I can get one quarter inch in here to make everything perfectly level, that's a good thing. Anything more than that should be stacked in steel or high density plastic. And then these gaps in between here, that needs to be fixed with a grout or a slurry or a mortar, some sort of mix, so that we don't have that open and available for insects, termites, that water, everything else to enter the building, all right? Um, with the beams, you know, we're looking mainly, mainly for deflection, damages, and things like that. This is a list, this list is gonna be shown over and over again. Um, and it pretty much goes to the whole structure. I got it, all right? So if we're putting all our load in one spot, that's probably where we're gonna overload that beam and we're gonna see some sort of movement and damage to it. Um, you're, don't be surprised when you see a beam sitting on the wood itself and then all of a sudden you see the, the beam where it's compressing up underneath that wood post. It happens, all right? Um, Lateral support, anything that's missing, anything that's notched or hold, uh, leaning, past repairs, wood rot, uh, termites, you know, rotating, twisting, especially when we're dealing with beams. They get their strength from being directly up and down. Once I start letting them rock, then I'm going to run into problems. Uh, steel, when steel starts to rust, it's going to expand at first, and then once that rust weakens the actual structure, then it's going to start to sag. All right, and those connections, um, yeah, to the post and columns and joists, I, I got to say that about 90% of the homes that I go into, those bolts that tie the, the post and the beams together, they're always loose. And I, I don't know what to say. There's so much weight on there that I've never really seen any of those move. Can it? Yeah. You know, should they be tightened? Why not? You know, but I really don't think it's the end of the world. They've been that way for a long time. Right? So when we're dealing with concrete floors, I would like you to be able to recognize two different methods to put concrete floors up. One of them is gonna be uh, post-tensioning the concrete, where the other one's gonna be pre-stressing the concrete. Notice the diagrams are basically the same, all right? It's basically when we're putting the stresses on this concrete whether we're doing it in the factory or we're doing it on the job site, all right? Um, so concrete, we mentioned, is strong in compression, all right? But yet, when I put concrete as a horizontal surface like this, the bottom is gonna be under tension while the top is gonna be under compression. So I need to, because concrete's weak in tension, I need to somehow strengthen up that weakness in tension. So these drawings, as you're seeing here, they're gonna run a steel rod along the bottom inside these different holes in there, and they're gonna s squeeze these things in together 
and put pressure on that concrete and squish it together. And as long as I'm compressing it, I'm going to go ahead and make it um, make it much much stronger where it comes in here. So pre-stress we do that in the factories and we deliver it. Post tension there's going to be um, holes that are holes that are present. We're going to end up running the steel rods through it. There's going to be bolts and then they're going to crank them down until they get to the right amount of tension on that steel that, that's on there as well. Um, Mike added on here the Simpson straw tie makes retrofit anchor bolts and they're not the only manufacturer of stuff like that so there are other ways around it and we're not going to know always what's sticking or what is in there just because we're not going to be able to see it um, so again grabbing them and moving them not such a bad thing talking about the anchor bolts all right so concrete slabs in the floor um, you know and, and I use the term one quarter inch and here it says larger than one eighth of an inch so it's kind of the same thing but concrete slabs on the floor some of these things are shrinkage cracks where some of them are are more serious where it comes into it my ability to change things here. I'm going to skip out of this just for a second. And then this way I can see things again. Good. Sorry about that. And then let's go back to here. And since I know I could zoom in a little bit more again, we're going to go ahead and zoom in where we were. All right. So we were talking about cracks in the floors as well. And um, Now we're going to do a little bird's eye view. On here we're going to talk about the different types of cracks that we may be seeing. That was a little wet there, sorry. Alright, so we're bird's eye view, we're looking straight down. L-shaped house is what we're looking at here. And let's put a few posts in here out in the middle. Okay. So if I start seeing cracks around the post that more or less go in a circle pattern like that, you start and, and maybe you'll see them in different rings coming around here as well. Anything that's a circular motion like that is settlement or heaving or settling. All right. And that's what they're showing in um, that was in the diagram beforehand. So it's going up or down. When I start seeing cracks where they just come off the corners like that, that's normal. Those don't bother me at all. Those are typical shrinkage cracks um, when we come into things. And it's common, all right? In fact, remember that 90 degree angle thing that we were talking about beforehand? So right in this area, when I have this inside turn, that's probably one of the most common areas. And because I'm going to have another four 90 degree turns, just like what this here, these are going to be common areas where I'm going to get the cracking. Many times you're going to actually see a crack going from a post right to that corner. All right, that's normal. 
All right, as long as they're not uneven, we're not getting water coming through it. Um, sometimes they're gonna put control joints in there so they'll actually notch it, which is a great idea. They're gonna put a control joint right into this area here, hoping to cause that crack to occur right there. So if we got cracking inside of a control joint, it was designed to do that, all right? That's not a bad thing when that happens. Now, if I get a crack where it's going all the way across and then it's going up the wall this way and up the wall that way, that pretty much tells me this whole section is dropping down. So I'm gonna probably wanna look and see outside if there's any sort of water such as sloping sidewalks, sloping driveways, sloping earth, anything that's directing water to cause that part of the house to settle. If I see a crack in the floor going across and again, you know, angles going up into the corners. Sorry about that. And an angle is going up into the corners up in here. That's, I'm going to be focusing on discharges and water coming into that corner. So typically if I get settlement from the from water, I'm going to have sister cracks. All right, there's going to be typically two of them. Posts that go up and down, we're going to have circles around them. Anything that has kind of like a spider web crack on it, those are common for, um, those are going to be common for shrinkage or curing of the concrete. And quite frankly, I don't really consider that a big deal whatsoever. All right. Let's go back and get this on here again. I think I know what's happening here. Okay. So if it's hollow below a concrete slab, and in this drawing we're showing pre-stressed or, I'm sorry, pre, yeah, pre-stressed or post-tensioning on the slab, you know, we may have basement underneath the garage, all right? It is doable. This will support that weight and we don't have to worry about what's underneath it. And I have run into houses like that before, all right? And I'm sure you will too um, when it comes in there. All car garage parking decks are kind of that way. So the engineers can design this to make sure that it works. However, if they're not and it's just standard concrete and we do start getting a lot of settlement, that's when you're gonna see dipping and changes in everything right over here. Right, we'll go through some of these slides if we're seeing that the pieces are missing, rusted, uh, rust stains coming through to it, we know things are going to be moving. Our main goal is to see if it has been moving or settling when it comes to it. Uneven surfaces for us, we go with three quarter inches, our line in the sand, we call that a trip hazard. Um, and of course any water coming in is always something that we recommend that people get repaired. Most settling is considered minor. However, if it's a constant ongoing thing, it can be catastrophic. It can be very expensive. Um, I remember I did one house that had so much settling and it was a, what they call a 203K loan. And they had to borrow $100,000 just to get all the supporting piers going all the way around the outside of the house. It was a big home. But $100,000 is a lot of money, at least to me it is, all right? Spalling is any time water gets in between the layers, freezes, and pushes off the face of the concrete. Sometimes you'll see spalling if the uh, slurry or the cream coat on the concrete was too thin. And just by people walking on it is enough to make it come loose. So it does happen with the spalling. When we start getting into wall, framing right now um and like a few other words i want you to know is is shear and shear walls um so what we're talking on this drawing here is an actual shear wall so when we use plywood osb anything that's hard wood on here and we use that in the corners that's got its strength is to keep my 
my wall studs from shifting or racking when it comes into it. Its weakness is a, it's a pretty solid material, so it's a very poor insulator um, when it comes with it. So for most of the time, we want to use a decent insulation. So a styrofoam, a sheathing, maybe a sheetrock, something that's going to create. The, the lighter it is, the better the insulation value that's going to be in there. All right. Studs are going up and down in our area. We're very common with 16 inches on center. I think you're going to start seeing more of two by six framing and they're typically going to go two foot on center. I think we're going to see a lot of changes to that in the upcoming future. The less wood, we're getting more into energy conservation and less onto the strength of the structure. So if the engineers can prove that, hey, building these things two foot on center is just as strong, you know, with the thicker lumber, and yet if we get rid of, you know, one out of every four, um, or actually it's two out of every four, isn't it? But we'll say one out of every three. Um, one out of every three studs, then we have less places where we're going to get that uh, heat transfer through condensation because you get that thermal bridging through the two by four studs that much more. So the goal is to insulate houses and, and make it more energy efficient. So the first one was a sheer wall. This is called a sheer brace. I know it says sheer wall on there. Please forgive me. This is a brace. And doing this, now all of my sheathing back here can all be some sort of insulated material. So I think we're going to start going back to this type of framing um, to where, so we can get more insulation in there, less studs, and so forth. And again, we do a, we make a triangle out of this. So up, down, across, and that's the main goal is to prevent the wall from racking or coming into it. I know this, you know, this obviously is a garage, and um, but when houses are finished and we insulate them and we cover them with drywall, we don't have the luxury of seeing the structure anymore. That's what's nice about these. So here we got styrofoam insulation. That's what the yellow stuff is here. We do have shear walls over here in the corner. Um, these are two by four um, separations in between here. And these are two by six um, studs that come in there as well. And again, I think this is, you know, you can also see in our corners, they're going to be using less lumber. What used to be three or four pieces of lumber in here we were, they're trying to get by with only one or two and then put some little more blocking and that way in the corner you could start filling these things in with foam. Um, it, it's just, I forgot what it's called, it's OVE. Um, I know that's the acronym but I can't remember what OVE um, stands for but yeah it'll probably come to me or hopefully somebody will type it in here and then I'll share with you. Uh, it, it's just another building technique and it's a way to make it more energy efficient, use less wood, you know, and, and protect our environment a little bit more. Um, top plates. So you can actually get by with a single top plate. It is allowable, all right? But when we do top plates, and I guess I should go back here, this one, if we look at the top up here, we do have a single top plate on this one. But notice that my stud is directly below that truss and this stud is directly below that truss all right so all the load bearing points need to be solid from top to bottom i cannot have a truss fall in between here while i have a single top plate when i put the double top plates up here so here we got two of them um, two things it does it gives me a way to tie in my perpendicular walls easier okay which is nice makes things a little bit more solid. Um, but now I can also put my floor joist anywhere. All right, having these doubled up on here means I don't have to land directly on top of the stud that's below it. Or if I'm putting up, if it's an exterior wall and I'm putting up trusses, then those again, they, they won't have to land right onto the wall. All right. Um, headers, top plates, studs are 16 inches on center, sole plates are on the bottom. And I'm going to do this quick and, and move along on it. So the sole plate is the bottom piece of lumber that's going on top of the deck. Studs are going on top 
or straight up and down, I'm sorry. And then on top, we have a double top plate. Our header is the load bearing that supports our opening. And then these are cripples or, or mini studs that bring it down. Now remember here, we put our board up underneath here. Now, as long as all we're doing is putting a window in there or maybe an overhead door, optimum value engineering. Thank you very much. I remember the, I love you guys. You know, I remember the acronym, but I couldn't remember what the words meant. OVE stands for Optimum Value Engineering. Luke Mulliken, thank you very much. All right. So going back on to our studs, you know, we have that bottom uh, two by four piece of lumber going all the way across. Most of the time, they're just going to shoot nails in there. Probably won't create an issue unless we're going to try and use that as support that comes in there. All right. Trimmers, cripples, anytime we have anything shorter than uh, a complete stud is when these things come in here. We mentioned before about floor joists are an inch and a half. Headers and girders are three inches. You know, same thing with headers. Depending on the length of the header and how much weight it's supporting, sometimes I can get by with an inch and a half support for that header. Sometimes I'm going to need three inches of support. All right. Some more rules. Um, that come into play if a wall is load bearing or not. We are allowed to make holes and make notches into them, run plumbing, electric, but there's only a limited amount that has to come in there. So for load bearing walls, holes are 40%, notches 25%, non load bearing walls you can go up to 60%, um, notches are 40%. Anytime I get within an inch and a half, I believe, I keep forgetting if that's inch and a half or inch and a quarter, but anytime I get within an inch and a half of the surface area, then I need to put a nailing plate for protection. So whatever I'm running through that hole, if it's a plumbing pipe or electrical or whatever, and in our area, because we deal with conduit, we're not so much worried about the electric, but we are worried about the plumbing. Um, we need to have plates on there so the drywall guys can't drive screws into it. I do want you to remember 40 and 60 and 25 and 40, depending if it's load bearing or non load bearing. All right. Different types of columns that we run into steel, lolly columns. The reason why you put the rubber membranes, and not everybody does this, but the reason why it's there is because of the moisture and the salts that are in there, we don't want to let the uh, that humidity, that moisture, that and stuff that's in there. We don't want to let that get to the steel and cause it to rot out. On top of it, you're going to see most of the time, sorry about that. On the top of these, you're going to, most of the time, we're going to see bolts on there. And like I said, I find them loose all the time. Um, once or twice, I see where they have the straps where they just fold them over. Okay. And I don't think I've ever seen one where it was actually welded in place where it comes to us. Our most common process is going to be these nuts and bolts on here. Should be true. Uh, plumb straight up and down. And these are usually four inch columns, sometimes three inch columns. So one inch would be our maximum lean. But, but truthfully, these should never be leaning at all. All right. And these are the bolts that I was talking about. And these actually look pretty snug coming in here. But um, I, I tell you this much, I have seen when they get delivered, Sometimes the delivery guys will just throw them into the basement. And I've seen where these things have been bent. And I'm not too sure. You know, you see a line right up over there. I've seen where they've gotten bent. And then when you put the bolts into place, that lifts it back up there. And when we're dealing with steel, um, you can only bend it one time. And it'll bend down. But once you bend it back up again, then it's going to snap or crack. Um, we want to eyeball that, all right? We do have to have a certain distance. Uh, this is a continuous beam with the posts in the middle. So I have to have at least four inches. So if that lolly column is four inches, we're good. If it's three inches, we know we got at least some on some side of it. Um, but yeah, it's not smaller than that. But we have to have at least four inches. If there was a seam on this thing, then I would need three inches on each side for a total of six inches going over the whole thing. Here's another post where it was bent up and over, just so you can see what it looks like. Um, so temporary post and permanent post. I would like to talk about these. Um, there are adjustable columns that are permanent, all right? 
they are screw jacks that come in there. Those are just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the temporary ones are the ones that have holes in them and they're adjustable for different heights. We can't use those for permanent installations. Or at least they're not supposed to be using. And again, if I see them, we're going to call them out. Again, don't let somebody else's problem become your problem. Plain and simple. All right. So these here, whoops, I jumped over too much. So these are the holes that I'm talking about. These are temporary posts that comes in there. Now this house did have a lot of termite damage into it. The termite was also into the beam up in here. Somebody tried to do some repairs and they sandwiched that beam with two by 12s. They were trying to lift everything back up in here. Um, and then they ran out of money and the home ended up getting foreclosed on. So now this is something else that somebody else wants to take over and purchase. And what is it that you need to do? You know, so we know we need to get some good posts in there. We know we need to have a good foundation or a footing underneath that post. We may be replacing some beams coming in here. I mean, every problem can be fixed. So the question is always going to be how much is it going to cost to get it fixed? And obviously, who's going to pay for it, you know, to get it fixed. So knowing these things, we're allowed to give good advice to our clients, plain and simple. Um, concrete, there's two types or two schools of thoughts on filling in these gaps with concrete. Um, one thought is, I don't want to take a chance of that beam twisting or rotating. So I want to fill that in there with the mortar, the brick, the concrete, make sure that it's solid and it's not going to move. Um, the other school is, well, you're putting the concrete and water right where the steel or the wood is, and now you're going to create a pocket where you're going to hold all that water in there, should it get in there, and you're not going to know about it, um, and that's going to cause that beam to rot out. Okay. And I can see an argument for both of them, all right? So I don't, and not only that, but I don't know what my bearing is on this. I don't know how far that beam goes in there. We do need to have three inches up there in that spot, which I can't confirm it. So, you know, I, I don't know, I'm going to throw some disclaimers out there, but mostly I'm going to look and see if there's anything, if this is doing what it's doing. And truthfully, looking at what I'm seeing right here, there's no cracks, no signs of multiple repairs, no signs of rust in that steel I-beam. I'm actually comfortable. I would let my clients know about it, you know, but I don't think I would make uh, too much of an issue out of things whatsoever. All right. So, and again, that's my two cents. Um, I'm throwing my disclaimer out there right away. If you disagree with me, I, I fully respect you. There is no, you know, I'm not telling you what your opinion should be, but I'm just trying to give you things to think about. All right. So when we're talking about uh, floor trusses and and floor joists, I, I do want you to know the difference, all right? Uh, truss is going to be engineered. Um, we refer to that as lightweight construction. So up at the very top, this is a truss. Even this where it says wood eye, that is a truss, all right? Plywood, laminated veneers, those are also considered lightweight construction when we're dealing with stuff, even the parallel strand board. So everything here is engineered wood, all right? Um, open, uh, open floor trusses in, um, you'll find them in, as long as it's a basement, there's really not going to be too much of a deal with it. Now, when I'm dealing with trusses, I'd like to be a little on the anal retentive side. All right. These can't, at least the cords, um, or any open trust. And we're going to get to a slide that talks about modifying them. And we'll talk about it on roof as well. And the general rule of thumb is you just don't do it. You don't modify them in any which way. All right. However, I need you to know they are modifiable. All right. But, you know, for repairs or if somebody needs to remove a section of them and design them, you're going to need a structural engineer. I would prefer it be somebody from the trust manufacturing company. But there needs to be a piece of paper that's associated with this. And they should stay in the house and stay with the house. Because if I bought this house and it had a modification to the truss and now I want to go sell it, I would expect that home inspector to come out here, hey, somebody cut this truss, it's been modified, I don't know if this is good enough, 
Now I'm going to get questions from my buyer. I need to have that document of paper saying, yes, it was cut. And here's the modification to this and what says that it's okay. All right. So no, some of the names that are on here, I'd like you to be familiar with it. When we're dealing with floor, uh, floor trusses, the top piece going across is known as the top cord. The bottom piece going across is the bottom cord. All the pieces in the middle are web members that come in here. And again, a truss or floor joist, beams, every piece of lumber gets its strength when it's plumb, when it's straight up and down. Once I started allowing that load to turn over and twist, I'm really losing the strength of that truss. They are designed to be under tension and compression. So what I mean by that is this bottom cord will be under tension. This top cord will be under compression. When you're looking at these things, they're tedious. We want to look at every single gusset plate that's on here. And all the connections are gusset plates that go in there. We want to make sure there's no notching, breaking, damaging, slipping. Look for the hammer, hammer heads on the pieces of steel. Yes, am I that anal retentive? The real question is yes. If they're damaged, they could be repaired. You can cover them up with wood gusset plates. There's some communities that don't even allow steel gusset plates in residential construction. Or if they do, it has to be a sprinklered home when they do any sort of lightweight construction, no matter how you do it. Um, in the town that I live in, if we put up any of those pieces of lumbers, LVLs, um, floor trusses, eye joists, uh, laminated beams, um, I already mentioned laminated veneer lumber, any of those in residential construction that's new today, I have to have a house or a fire sprinkling system installed as well. The only time they allow you to build a home in this town without a fire sprinkler is when everything is dimensional lumber. All right. And because I needed a couple of beams installed, my options were steel or, but they was, you know, or I had to go ahead and get some sort of a, what's called a flitch plate is what I ended up building on mine. So we had to put three pieces of steel because I only had seven and a half inches of opening to work with because it was a remodel, but we did keep some of the original structure. We didn't take everything down to the bare bones. And I only had seven and a half inches to work with. And in order to get the weight and the support loads from the, that I needed from the architect, you had three pieces of half inch steel that were 20 feet long sandwiched between four pieces of ply or not plywood of two by eight lumber in there. And we had a bolt high and low every 16 inches to secure that whole thing together. It took, I want to say, like eight guys to get that thing. And we took it up in pieces and assembled it and dropped it in a hole. It was a nightmare, plain and simple. All right. So low bearing points as well is something to be aware of. When we're dealing with trusses and more specifically, like these are called trim trusses. Now, these sections here, when you see the plywood, sorry about that. When you see the plywood in these areas here, these are designed to be cut, all right? You just can't go past this line right here. So when they sell the trusses, they don't know exactly how long they're gonna need. So these are these are the type you would buy at the, the Home Depots, the Menards, or the Lowe's, the, the major supply stores. They'll have them in stock on site. Um, no, not always, but you know, so they'll have them there. And you can just buy a section of these things and then you would trim them to get them to fit exactly where you want. But you can't go past this mark here. So these are all the different gusset plates that I was working on. Now this is an eye joist part here. This is not designed for any sort of structural support whatsoever. If this is plywood on the outside here and it looks like it is, all right, then I would have to have squash blocks or something to take um, supports in here. So they would put two by fours up and down on each side of these floor joists in here to make it solid um, because the plywood isn't designed to, to carry the weight of the, the walls and the structure and that's whenever there's a pinch point. So I got low bearing below, I got low bearing above, that's my pinch point and so I need to have some sort of two by fours. I'll show pictures of that in a little bit. All right, All right here's our trusses. 
no cutting, no notching, nothing else. But again, we can do it if we have a structural engineer or an architect, somebody with that PE stamp that designs it and the plan should be there. They're the ones that can say it's okay. All right. TJI, um, that stands for Trust Joist Industries. They are the manufacturer of this product here that we're looking at called Silent Floors. Um, they also make uh, laminated uh, boards that go around the outside as well for those squash blocks that I was talking about. Uh, they're, they're trusses, all right? They have a top cord and they have a bottom cord and all this wood in the middle is the web of everything else. So instead of just using two by fours for the web, we're gonna have solid pieces of wood in there, all right? Here we're showing them being used for um, rafters and that's fine. Long distances, they can do all that as long as they live into the weights. We can't cut the top cord. We can't cut the bottom cord, all right? So they do have special brackets on here that allow you to get that angle that you need so you don't have to notch this. If I notch it, um, there are repairs for it. Don't get me wrong. It's not the end of the world if somebody does cut it, but we're not supposed to, all right? And you're gonna find a, a bunch of slides here and I'll probably end up zipping through these things as, as the later ones go through. It's common, it's a habit. People don't, don't respect the trusses and I need to get my bathtub drain in this situation. I need to get it right there. So I need to get that top cord of that floor joist. You never should have put your floor joist where my plumbing needs to go. Um, reminds me of cool hand Luke and moving dirt. But nonetheless, they cut it. This doesn't mean it's the end of the world. They do have repairs for these sort of things. Um, if you go to the Trust Joist Industries website, you can actually find their detailed drawings. This isn't where we have to hire an architect or uh, where we have to hire an architect or a structural engineer to go ahead and create the drawings because they've already been created, all right? So these type of repairs happen or these damages happen and the repairs are common and you can go ahead and look up those details um, through any of the manufacturers of the eye joist, all right? Same thing here, they drill through the, the top cord just to get the electric through it. Here they notched it to get the plumbing pipes through it. It happens, all right? Um, proper joist hangers are also kind of a, a big thing. And these I just don't recognize. So if I don't know something, I'm gonna say I don't know, but it's not the typical joist hangers that I see. However, um, I would like you to recognize this piece of wood that's stuffed in here. So back in here in the upper right corner is the original plywood of the eye joist. But notice now where the bottom cord, and you can see it pretty well on the top cord, that's all flush, all right? So now instead of the shape of the letter I, we now made a rectangle out of that. That's called a web stiffener. Those two pieces of, in this case it's OSB, and it's made by uh, TJI or the Santa Floor Systems to fit right in there, all right? We fill that and we make that section a rectangle, so that's the same as having a squash block in this area. If I had to tie my uh, if I had to tie my um, joist hanger into another eye joist, I would, that would have to be a rectangle as well. But in this case, I'm using one of their um, inch and a half or three inch boards uh, for their structural support or their rim joist boards is what it is. And they make those at the same height as whatever the TJIs are. So then you can use these going around the outside and we don't have to have squash blocks now on exterior walls because this is what's gonna be supporting the weight when it comes to it. Another view, I like this one a little bit better. This is the web stiffener in here. And even up in this one here, that's also a web stiffener. So here's my eye joist. I'm gonna take this eye joist and go right into it because of which I need to have a web stiffener behind it, make a rectangle out of this, and then same thing coming across here. These are squash blocks. They're using the same OSB wood, and that's fine, is what they have on the outside. Below these squash blocks, we have a beam underneath there. Above it, we're gonna have a load-bearing wall above that. Because it's a beam underneath and a load-bearing wall above, 
that's that pinch point that I was talking about because of which we need to have these squash blocks or and I've seen people use two by fours which is just fine you know here they just used lot probably some scrap uh, rim boards that they had going around the outside or box joist boards going around the outside and they use that for their squash blocks totally acceptable all right same thing here we're just looking at two by fours being used again we probably have a low bearing point up above it one on each side um, you know i mean you're supposed to be there sometimes you can't fit it in there because of utilities gas plumbing heating electric whatever but we should have one on each side and I'm not going to let somebody else, you know, again, it's not my problem that I can't fit it in there. All right. And I don't want to be the guy that says it's okay. Let somebody else do that. All right. Um, here we're looking at a foundation wall. We got exterior insulation on the concrete foundation wall. I like all this stuff. You can see where the exterior of the concrete is sticking out further. That's going to be for a brick ledge. We don't have that concrete sticking out here on the sides because we're going to have siding over here. So they're probably only going to be putting brick in the front or probably just around this area here because this section does not look like it has a brick ledge on it either. All right, so, we, so we're going to have a brick veneer over here. Then we put all our eye joist in and we probably have beams underneath here holding the support. And you can see all the squash blocks in there as well. All right, the OSB, this is purchased from uh, TJI or whoever the manufacturer is and you know again that's our supports around the outside so I don't have to have squash blocks on the perimeter walls I only need them over beams and underneath load bearing walls all right again close up um, they missed a little bit with the anchor bolts so these anchor bolts here they're going to be broken off and taken off um, but that's what was supposed to be holding down this sill plate underneath here. Um, obviously that's a, a whoops, all right, that has happened. So go back with the trusses again. We'll zip through this pretty quick. We got our top cord, we got our bottom cord, all our middle pieces inside are gonna be our web members in there. We hold all those pieces of lumber together with what's called gusset plates on there. Those gusset plates can be wood or steel. Um, most of the time what we're gonna see is gonna be steel. It's a manufactured process, and then they deliver the um, they deliver the trusses to the site. All right, trusses should be installed on their bearing points. This is a good spot here. This piece of lumber and bearing points have to be solid from top to bottom. Now they do make trusses that are bottom bearing, and they do make trusses that are top bearing. All right, either way is acceptable. But if it's a bottom bearing truss then I have to have solid lumber. I can't put a low bearing wall right up underneath here or maybe right underneath here. It's got to have solid lumber underneath it. Now, if for some reason I need to have a low bearing wall, again, they have made modifications. You can do this to the truss. They could solidify all this stuff up in there. So there are repairs that can happen. It's not the end of the world, all right? Same thing with the eye joist. Top cord, bottom cord, middle is the web. We kind of chatted on that already. We talked about the web stiffeners. Um, if we're going to have joist hangers coming across, we talked about the web stiffeners holding that up. Squash blocks, basically, they make a rectangle out of everything, or we're going to have them on either side. Only have to be located whenever it's at a pinch point. So if I got pressure from below and pressure from above, that's my pinch point that comes in there. Okay. Here's another view of an actual one. This piece was kind of left over or cut on here just so we could see what it looks like. Um, here we had, we were in the basement and we looked above and that's a load bearing wall there and there's no squash blocks, all right? So before we call things out that there's no squash blocks, we went above to see if there's a load bearing wall from above, and it wasn't. It was all open or it was off to the side. If that's the case, then we don't have to have squash blocks at these locations, all right? And again, we see our squash blocks. The rim joist is the squash block, so we don't have to have them installed there as well. I'm gonna skip over the brick and the brick veneer section here. 
This is repetitive. Um, we did this on the exterior one. So if you want to see this and talk about it, um, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to watch the exterior section. Thank you for bearing with me. And again, this is all talking about brick, true brick and brick veneer and different things to hold stuff together. All right, so now we're gonna get to the roof and that's gonna be the end of stuff um, once we finish with this section here. I would like you to be able to tell the difference between a truss and a rafter. And if you're shaking your head, come on, how basic are we gonna get? I'm sorry, but there are gonna people that don't know the difference, all right? I'd also like to use the proper terminology when you're identifying the different types of rafters and the different trusses and the different parts of each when it comes with it, all right? Um, the term rafter or stick frame construction, that's our upper left that we're looking at here. Uh, these are gonna be, you know, whether they're two by sixes, eights, tens, twelves, depends on the length and whatever the engineer or architect have designed or planned for it to be. Um, the term rafter is gonna be used when the rafter actually sits on the top plate or on the wall of the structure and it reaches either the other rafter on the opposing side or the ridge board or ridge beam at the top. If it makes it all the way to the top or the bottom and it touches at both ends, it's called a rafter. If it does not make it to both the top and the bottom, then it's called a jack. So this one here is known as the hip rafter. If it's on an outside corner, it's a hip. An inside corner, it's a valley. Because it touches the top and the bottom, it's a valley rafter or a hip rafter. This one is part of the hip, but it doesn't touch both sides, so this is a hip jack. Same thing with this one over here. It'll touch the top plate, but it won't make it to the, I'm sorry, it'll touch the rim joist. Boy, I'm having trouble with my words and pulling them out of there. It'll touch the ridge board at the very top, but it doesn't make it to the top plate down low. It makes it to the valley rafter. So because of which, it's called the valley jack that comes in here. So rafters make it all the way up to the ridge board and the top plate. Jacks do not. If it's part of an outside turn, it's a hip. If it's part of an inside turn, it's a valley, plain and simple. I'd like you to know the difference between a, a roof joist and a roof rafter, or just plain rafter. Uh, 212 is our magic number, all right? Anything 212 or less is considered a flat roof, so if we have a flat roof on this thing, it's not really gonna be a rafter, it's gonna be a roof joist that comes in there. Anything over 212 is gonna be a rafter, all right? This goes back to showing kind of what I explained earlier, talking about the jacks. The full lane up and down here is a rafter. A common rafter is going straight and not part of the hip or the valley. And where a hip jack is part of the hip and the valley. All right. So realize we're making triangles out of things when we're, when we're building roofs and houses where it comes with it. And as long as that triangle is intact, we're good. All right. But in order for that sag that we're seeing up here to happen, if this is going to drop down, then those walls have to be pushed out, all right? So we all we have to do to maintain our triangle, usually our ceiling joist will do this, and that's what goes across here. That's gonna keep my walls from bowing out. As long as I prevent my walls from bowing out, we're golden, all right? But if I do let that happen, then it's gonna be a problem. What typically happens for ceiling joist, you're gonna see we'll get usually around like five or six nails in here so we get a lot of stress support. Then they're gonna overlap and let them run wild in here. And then again, at least five nails or more holding these things together, that's one option. Narrower, smaller houses, they may go with a continuous board. Um, sometimes people are gonna to wanna to keep these things lined up for whatever reason. 
Usually you're going to have a wall in between there, so it doesn't really come into play so much. Um, but nonetheless, if they do, then they'll butt these things, B-U-T-T, them up next to each other. And they're going to use the plywood decking above here as more of a gusset plate to keep those things from coming apart. All right. So if I butt it, I need to have some sort of a gusset on top of that. And that's what the plywood flooring from above does. And this drawing kind of shows what I was trying to explain earlier. Single piece of lumber going all the way across. But we need to make sure that we're secured to our rafters at both ends on there. Uh, 412, and I don't see this done too much. It's, it's actually pretty easy or makes construction much easier to put the ridge board up on there. But you don't have to have one. So that's hops in alignment, all right? Whereas a ridge beam is actually load supporting. Now in this situation, notice that our ceiling joists don't go side to side, all right? In fact, it's actually open there. So what I'm doing on the other hand is I'm preventing this top from going down. As long as I prevent that top from going down, then that in itself is going to prevent my walls from bowing out. All right. So that's a ridge beam. A ridge beam is load supporting where a ridge board is more of a nailing point to it. All right. Rafter sags. Um, if it's too thin, heavy wood, heavy uh, snow loads, maybe there's a lot of roofs on it, something where it's overweighting. You know, we want to avoid the sag. We have a few different methods to go ahead and avoiding the sag on there um, and, and making them stronger. You know, common sense stuff here. Splits, splices, damages, warping, um, concentrated load we talked about, wood rot, insect damage, everything else. Those are all design, what things that we're going to be looking for when we're in the attic. So different methods that we're going to do to prevent that rafter sag is, and what's common in, in our neck of the woods here around Chicago, is something called collar ties. So typically they're going to be installed every four feet, so we don't have to have one on every roof. They're going to be, they're supposed to be halfway up between the top of the rafter and the, the top plate or the bottom of the rafter, and it's supposed to go all the way across. We should be having a lateral support on here too, that will I might have lost signal I think I lost signal on here so I'm going to stop it and start it again I did. 